Th thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I suppose I should declare at the outset that my son is a recipient of disability living allowance uh, and my wife a recipient of carer's allowance. So the issues and arguments and discussions that relate to the benefit system, its interaction with individuals uh, and changes that are taking place and how it is administered uh, are not germane to me. They are they're very much part uh, and parcel of our everyday life. And one of the issues that uh, I've been considering because we're in the process of reapplying for my son's disability living allowance um, is that element of reapplication and reassessment that many individuals and families have to go through, not just for disability living allowance, but for eligibility for other benefits. And it takes a long time. And it doesn't take a long time because necessarily the size of the form, although that is a consideration. It takes a long time because uh, uh, there's no other way to put it. Sir. It's utterly soul destroying to have to fill in a form uh, of multiple pages explaining all the things that your child is incapable of doing. Uh, and that uh, is an emotional burden that for many families results in them taking a very long time to complete these forms uh, and as a result losing out on entitlements as a consequence because obviously until reapplication goes through entitlements cannot then be uh, picked up again. So the longer it takes for a family to go through that process the longer it will then take for them to receive the benefits to which they are entitled. Now, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that, presiding officer. One thing which strikes me as something that should be looked at is whether the reassessment and reapplication process should involve some form of uh, advising whether there have been uh, any changes since the application was last made which could be backed up by health professionals or others that is something I think would be worthy of investigation I make no commitment or comment other than that but I think it's certainly something that would merit investigation which would perhaps reduce some of that emotional burden uh, but also uh, reduce the length of time that for many individuals it can take to fill in these applications now other members have talked about the issue around interactions um, between benefits and, and that is an issue that I think is going to be uh, extremely important for us to uh, consider uh, as, as these uh, issues, uh, as, as these powers come into being and as policy uh, and thinking around it develops because uh, while uh, as Annabel Goldie I think highlighted in terms of the sums of money involved around two and a half to two and three quarters of a billion pounds is going to be uh, devolved in terms of welfare responsibility. There's still going to be around £15 billion uh, that will remain reserved at Westminster. And some of those benefits, uh, particularly in relation to universal credit, are dependent on interactions of benefits, interactions around income. And Christina McKelvey, I think, was entirely right to focus on the question of clawback. And uh, I noted during the debate at Westminster on Monday that when specifically asked by my colleague Mary Black MP as to whether he would categorically state that any additional top up would not be clawed back or would not be categorised as income and be subject to clawback, the Secretary of State did not answer uh, directly to that question. He did not rule that out. And I think that is something that merits uh, further investigation. Indeed, uh, I understand that the, the Devolution and Further Powers Committee letter, which has been published this afternoon, asks the Secretary of State to uh, give clarity uh, in regards to that. Uh, and that uh, then would lead to a question around how that is going to be assessed. And I think uh, looking at today's announcement around HMRC, uh, I think one of the, the very real considerations and concerns that we should have is the impact that the decision around HMRC and the job losses that are going to be experienced at HMRC will have on the capacity and ability of HMRC to undertake some of those what will potentially be very complicated calculations and assessments around uh, decisions that have been taken here in Scotland and how those interact uh, in terms of an individual's benefit uh, entitlement and what role they will have to play with, it, with, with alongside the DWP. So these are, these are considerations that uh, are going to need to be uh, fleshed out uh, in order for us to ensure that the powers that we have can first of all be used to benefit the people we want to see benefit from them, but secondly, to ensure that any decision making around those uh, is able to be done properly and is not necessarily constrained, hamstrung, or at the very worst, mismanaged as a result of a lack of available staff and available time to undertake those assessments. There's another question, Mark, which, which arises, particularly in relation to those areas uh, of reserve benefit where we have the ability to top up, leaving aside the issue of potential clawback and, and income. And that is how new claimants uh, would be 
assessed and addressed. Because obviously, we, uh, where a benefit is reserved, uh, eligibility for that benefit will be the determination of DWP uh, and UK ministers. It will not be the determination of Scottish ministers. And therefore, while there are those who perhaps will lose eligibility for benefits as a result of welfare reforms, but this parliament has the ability to either top up or mitigate in those areas, if individuals in the future who would have qualified but are no longer able to even begin to qualify, there's a question around a disparity there uh, that would again need to be examined and need to be addressed. Now, that is not to say that there isn't, uh, that, 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 you know, uh, that there is not things that, that can and have been done in Scotland to support the most vulnerable. And we've spoken about the mitigation of bedroom tax, the establishment of the welfare fund, the council tax uh, benefit uh, replacement that was put in place. We also have areas uh, within our own responsibility, such as kinship care payments and ed ed educational maintenance allowance, where we have seen uh, very clear statements of intent from government and also uh, funding to follow that. But uh, even in these areas, there are questions around how future interactions uh, around universal credit will be handled. And I think the other thing that, that um, we, we need to bear into consideration is around personal independence payments and PIP. Um, because uh, one of the, the very clear statements that we made uh, in advance uh, of the debate was that any rollout of PIP should be halted until it was devolved which would have enabled us the opportunity to shape our own system according to what we felt the needs uh, of the population were. That hasn't happened. And one of the difficulties that is going to be faced in the future, and, and this, is, you know, this is irrespective of who forms the government at, at future points, is around the, the difficulties that are faced when you inherit a system uh, and have to then look at potentially reshaping it. And given that many people will have gone through uh, a, a very, you know, the very difficult process of having their benefit entitlements reassessed, reevaluated, uh, reformed, uh, the, 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 the difficulties that could be faced around redesigning a system in very short order after that, versus the ability to design your own system and put in place your own system. So that's another difficulty and another consideration that is going to be faced. And underpinning all of that, uh, is the issue around the fiscal framework, which Mr Rowley uh, rather un uncharitably suggested was uh, a, a sort of a, an entirely secret process when the Deputy First Minister has said he's willing to discuss with opposition parties the areas they want, to, uh, they, they want more clarity on and also uh, which will be subject to scrutiny uh, by this Parliament uh, by this Parliament's committees uh, in due course. So the, there are questions around that. And I think the, the, the point of agreement I would have Mr. with Mr. Rowley and with Mr. Chisholm, who's made the point in previous debates, is that what we must ensure is that that fiscal framework can in, ensures that the powers are deliverable, uh, but also ensures that Scotland is not hamstrung and loses out as a, uh, as a consequence. And I think if, we, if we're approaching it on that basis, and it seems that we have unity of purpose in regard to that, that can help make a very strong case, I think, to the Secretary of State to ensure that he brings forward a fiscal framework uh, that we can sign up to, we can agree with, uh, and that can ensure that the powers can be used for the benefit of the people of Scotland.